What a treat we have today. My guest is the illustrious scholar of music history, theory, and an expert of music in the 18th century gallant style, Dr. Robert Yerdigan. Dr. Yerdigan received his bachelor's in music composition from the California Institute of Arts, his MA in music theory and ethnomusicology from the University of Hawaii, and his PhD in music history and theory from the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of numerous scholarly articles and reviews in prestigious music journals, such as the Journal of Music Theory and Journal of New Music Research. In 2007, Dr. Yerdigan published Music in the Gallant Style with Oxford University Press to great acclaim and winning awards such as the Wallace Berry Award from the Society of Music Theory in 2009. Dr. Yerdigan, it's such an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and, and thank you for a very kind introduction. Let's begin first with the Gallant style, which is a word that not many people actually know. Uh, When they think of Mozart, they think of the word classical, as in part of the classical era. Um, But what is the Gallant era? You know, uh, people get their ideas about uh, maybe from from radio and and, um, uh, sites that sell uh, tracks. And and in in that world, uh, for a long time now, it, there, there's only so many flavors you have. You have Baroque, you have classical, you have Romantic. Uh, but those words come from the uh, the Romantic era. And they were looking back at an 18th century that they, they didn't understand very well. Remember, there were no recordings back then. I mean, if you, if you, if you tried to think back to music from 50 years ago, uh, maybe you're sure might have some memory of it, but you had no memory of it. And, and you could just sort of imagine what it was. Well, in the 18th century, uh, they had some pretty clear ideas about their music. And one of the words they used uh, for music at the court or in operas or in chambers, it, we're talking about the music of, of people with money, <laughs> not folk <laughs> music. Right. But they named it after the kind of person that would uh, the kind of ideal person that would um, enjoy that music, you know, in the same way that the word hip hop is used certainly to talk about a kind of music. But if you talk to people that are really in hip hop culture, it's a style of dress. It's a style of, of how you stand and, and how you uh, interact with people, right? It's, it's a whole way of being. Well, In the 18th century, late 17th century, 18th century, uh, a gallant man was, or a gallant woman, was uh, an aristocrat, somebody with money, who had uh, a lot of style. They had great clothes. They had, um, oh, it's a funny old word, insouciance. (laughs) Great word. they they, They didn't let things bother them, you know? They they had a kind of nobility of of manner. They had grace. Um, they interacted with high society very smoothly. Uh, they were just the ideal person. So a kind of music that was made for them and that they liked became associated with them, and it was called gallant music. It was the music for gallant people. Could we... Um... Put at an approximate time in the 18th century, what decades are we, are we looking at? Yeah, the, from the first, maybe 1720 to, um, oh, the time of Schubert, maybe. You know, so um, from Corelli to Schubert, maybe. You know, but it, it was dominant during that period, especially in the Mozart period. And uh, let me actually go back a little bit now and talk about Bach. And, and um, was Johann Sebastian Bach, he is typically known as a Baroque musician. Is that a term he would have used to describe himself? No. Uh, Baroque uh, actually meant a, a kind of ill-shaped pearl. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it was used to, 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 to describe things that were kind of over the top weird and, and overproduced. And uh, so again, it's, it's, it's a later time looking back at an earlier time and saying, oh, they don't like this so much. Um, I'm not sure what, what Bach would have described. Uh, you know, for one thing, he was, he was a church musician for much of his life, a courtly musician. Um, in, in his time, the, the three 
major uh, categories were church, chamber, and theater. So depending, you know, depending on which uh, patron he was working for, he could have been any one of those three, although he wasn't much of a theater musician, mostly church and chamber. Do we have a first gallant person, somebody who ushered in the era of the gallant? They're Italians, and they're not exactly household names, the early early ones. Uh, Bononcini was an important person. forerunner of this, and then uh, definitely the opera composers in Naples in the 1720s and 30s. So those would be people like Vinci, Leo, Feo. Again, you know, apologies, these are not household names. But, you know, things sneak up on people. I mean, if you think about hip hop, for example, uh, you know, there are world superstars today, but if you try and find the, the origins of hip hop, you know, the, the, there are some guys in in, the, in New York, in Brooklyn someplace, right? And and they, they weren't really household names. Are the names that you mentioned, are they not household names now, but perhaps back in the day, were they famous back in the day? Yes, yes. Yeah, they, they would be famous, you know, the way uh, that a great singer would be famous. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're not into 1950s vocal music, you've never heard of Frank Sinatra. But if you were alive during the 50s, there was nobody bigger than Frank Sinatra uh, or Elvis, you know, but, uh, but a certain style. So, yes, they were, they were household names of people who were into the most fashionable music. I got the sense reading your book that Italy had a massive influence in the development of music in Europe. Can you give a sense of the influence that the methods and style started in Italy? How did that affect the rest of Europe? Ah, Let's see. You know, this this goes all the way back to the Renaissance, really. So Italy, Italy developed a a modern way of being, not modern like, you know, the 20th century, but uh, modern in the sense of um, banking. OK, Italy developed banking. You know, people had uh, the equivalent of checking accounts suddenly instead of having to carry around bags of money. Um, they developed bookkeeping. They developed uh, trade. You know, uh, uh, Columbus, who discovered America, he's from Italy, right? <laughs> I mean, they were they were tremendous explorers. Uh, you had Galileo in science. Italy was really a hotbed of the new thing. Uh, as you go further north, let's say uh, northern Germany, uh, Scandinavia, they were quite a ways behind Italy. And so for a long time, um, If you were in one of those countries, uh, your development as a, let's say, a wealthy landowner uh, was that you you went to uh, the equivalent of high school and then you made a trip to Italy because your parents, your city wanted you to come into contact with all that was new and advanced. Uh, uh, Goethe, the the famous poet, he made his Italian journey and... uh, a Glinka from Russia, you know, in the early 19th century, has to travel to Italy to, I mean, even Mozart, when he's 14, travels to Naples to come into contact with, you know, the best and brightest in the world of opera. So there was this long tradition of Italy as being, uh, well, uh, more fashionable, for one thing. I mean, that continues to this, to this day, to some extent. Right. I mean, if we, if we think of fine design today, it might be uh, runways in Milan. It might be uh, Ferrari or Maserati automobiles. Right. So so the, Europe just had this opinion about um, Italy. Also, it, it was kind of an ethnic stereotype. They tended to think of Italians as sort of easygoing, friendly and very musical. There's a technique or at least a, a word called parimenti which you use quite often. And that is what they used widespread in Italy, this study of bass lines that leads to a whole comprehensive understanding of music. Yes. Um, you know, it, it goes back to uh, the Renaissance, as you said, uh, and the training of choir boys. You know, if you think of how many churches existed in Europe in the 19th century, uh, people didn't drive to church, they walked to, to, to church. So that meant uh, churches had to be everywhere and accessible. So there were hundreds of thousands of them, and everyone needed a choir. Uh, 
uh, and the bigger ones would have an organ. Uh, so that's a lot of musicians to train, or at least uh, semi-pro musicians <laughs> to train at the at the lower level ones. Uh, in in the Renaissance, uh, you know, a typical way to train was to have a given melody, uh, like uh, something from a chant, and then you would learn to improvise a counterpoint above it or below it. And so the best choir boys became really excellent improvisers of counterpoint. Now, beginning in the all early 17th century, it's the 1600s, and then very strongly by the time you get to the 18th century, uh, the voice that you'd learn to improvise against, it's kind of the lead sheet, you might say, uh, became a bass. So you didn't improvise below a bass, but you improvised above a bass. And it moved from, uh, from singing, although it never never went away. I mean, singing rem remained uh, vitally important, but it became a, a keyboard technique. So your, your master would write out a bass for you and you would play that with the left hand. With your right hand, you were supposed to create the rest of a composition. It's not easy to do at first. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they started small and started easy, but it was part of the basic training that you would be given a bass and with your right hand, you would complete a melody and possibly some chords. You know, it depended how much keyboard technique you had. Uh, this went from very simple things, you know, where you might have half notes and whole notes in the, the given bass to rather complex um, music. Uh, some partimenti, for example, are actually fugues written on one line. So you'll start out with the subject and then the clef will change and a new voice comes in. It's the counter subject, but you're expected to now play the answer in a different voice, <laughs> just from your head. Okay. And then the clef will change again. And maybe it's the subject coming back now for the third entry. Anyway, it's very challenging. Part of Menti, is that the same thing as thorough bass, or is it a different thing? They are, they are overlapping categories. Uh, thorough bass is the English translation of Generalbass in German, and, uh, you know, basso continuo in Italian. Uh, that tends to be the art of a company. In other words, you, you are in an ensemble or with a violinist or a singer, and you're playing a bass and some chords to a company. In a way, it's very much like what the jazz pianists do when they accompany vocalists and other you know, soloists. A partimento is a little different in that it's an independent composition. You're not accompanying anybody. And so instead of, a, well, from a player's perspective, you might say a, a sensitive accompanist knows how to stay away from what the soloist is going to do. In other words, they won't take that line that the soloist is going to take. They're, they're kind of hiding in the background and putting in little fills when the soloist is breathing or, or taking a break. With a partimento, by contrast, you want to take that, that best line. You know, you're the soloist. And so instead of hiding out, you have to actually, you know, come up with the theme and uh, develop it and vary it. And so it's, it's a road to composition rather than a road to accompaniment. Is it spontaneous or is it written down or is it both? Ah, those were two tracks and those were uh, actually different classes. Uh, the one was a keyboard skill as this, uh, the, and the other was written counterpoint, uh, what the Italians would call dispositions. You, you dispose of notes on various stages. In France, at the Paris Conservatory, many of the uh, great musicians who established the Paris Conservatory were Italian trained or Italian themselves. Um, I mean, Napoleon's uh, chapel master, the, the maestro di capella, the capella maestro, was Paisiello, who was Naples trained. So when they set up the Paris Conservatory, they took over the Italian curriculum wholesale every part of it. 
uh, but they gave they gave things different names. And so uh, a course in what was called uh, accompaniment, accompaniment, uh, that was keyboard playing of partimenti and accompanying melodies uh, with figures often. By contrast, there was a separate course called harmony where you were given a melody or a bass and you had to supply three other voices, you know, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, uh, in open score. So the, the two sides of the, uh, of the study, the written and the improvised, uh, turned into two separate courses in Paris. I'm, I'm not quite sure how they were divided in, in Naples, but there were, you know, there was written counterpoint and there was a partimento. And oftentimes there were two different teachers involved. Let me ask about counterpoint specifically then. There's that famous book by Fuchs, the Gratis book. Is that... Um, that I, I've I've read that that is trying to distill the concepts for how how to play counterpoint by a, a Renaissance master like Palestrina. Um, is counterpoint related to partimenti? I just I just want to make sure I'm not confused on the terminology. Sure. And, um, if you think of a partimento as a lead sheet, you're not too far off, right? And you know, with a lead sheet, you've got to know your chords. <laughs> you've got to know what to do, right? And in fact, the lead sheet is hard to work with if you don't actually know the song, right? I mean, if, if you've given a lead sheet to an unknown song, it's hard to know what, where to even begin. So with, with a partimento, it's like a lead sheet, but what you're supposed to supply are all the, you might say, default or best case melodies and harmonies for the patterns in the bass, right? So if the bass goes do, re, mi, to begin with, you have a stock set of patterns that go with that. Just like in a lead sheet, if, you know, if the chords go two, five, one, you've already practiced a hundred different ways to do that. So that's, that's how you approach a partimento. But those best melodies, those best counterpoints have all been, learned ahead of time and you learn some of them in the counterpoint cl class and uh, actually for the for the little boys that started at like age 10 and spent a decade doing this stuff in, in old Naples uh, they also learned these melodies in the class on solfeggio so you know in the solfeggio class you hear a bass and you sing a melody and you do that, you know, every, they did this six days a week. Well, clearly, if you are given a partimento and it has part of a mel part of a bass that you've already heard before, and you remember what you sang over it, well, then that feeds into uh, both counterpoint and partimento. You know, these melodies are swimming around in your head. It's like today. I mean, you could give uh, you could give a young student. Uh, the uh, the chords of a blues progression, but if they'd never heard any blues, they wouldn't they wouldn't come up with the right melodies. But if they had spent you know a hundred hours listening to BB King solos, <laughs> <laughs> they they would begin to know what to do. You know they would just associate a certain change with a certain melodic twist. And that's very much what they learn, but it's in, in terms of classical music. Now, is that uh, improvisation? So do they spontaneously, ha they must have a large vocabulary from what you're saying, that they do this quite often. They internalize these melodies. So they can spontaneously improvise either with their voice or on a keyboard instrument? Correct. Yep. Um, you know, if, if they were given an endless 18th century bass, they could improvise endlessly. <laughs> they could do it forever. You know, uh, I mean, those skills are still around uh, for some people. I mean, there are still organists that can uh, improvise, uh, you know, a postlude in, in a church, and, and they can go forever. Um, now, sometimes they've been trained in a way that, you know, is sort of like the French Conservatory, which, as I said, is, is kind of a, uh, the successor to the Naples Conservatories. But yes, um, uh, they, the music that was needed every day in the 18th century was, by and large, written 
the night before. You know, there wasn't a lot of standard repertory. I, I don't mean that there wasn't any. I mean, there were there were pieces that were highly valued and played year in, year out. But a lot of the music was fairly recent. And most music jobs, you know, like director of a church, director of a court, uh, you were expected to provide music for the court, a new opera every year, maybe two. Um, and so the ability to compose rapidly was very valuable. You know, you, you couldn't spend years thinking about your first symphony. Okay? <laughs> you, you, you had to crank stuff out every week. And so uh, I think improvisation was taught because uh, it meant that people, if they could improvise, they could compose rapidly. You know, they could just sit down and kind of improvise in their head and write it down. And it worked. Were audience members in the 18th century, now Now we're going straight into the Gallant era, were they expecting improvisations? Were they expecting the artists of the day to, as they say, extemporize or come up with things on the spot? Or were they, as today, you know, today we have fixed repertoire, repertoire is announced ahead of time, it's memorized, and it's performed. Um, is it, were the audiences expecting something different back then? There was not such a sharp, line drawn between improvisation and composition. You know, today, uh, if you go to, uh, let's say, a, you know, a concerto soloist with a symphony, um, they probably won't even improvise their own cadenza, right? They'll, they'll play a written out cadenza. I mean, there's a, there are a couple, um, Gabriela Montero, Montero, uh, she improvises, um, and and very successfully on the concert stage, but it, but it's rare. So um, you know today it's it's a it's a stark difference. Back then, uh, there's a little bit of improvisation probably in most solo music. You know, repetitions were expected to be varied. There are um, accounts in Italy of a singer uh, finishing an aria, and the audience claps and keeps clapping, which means sing it again. And they sing it again, but they vary it. There, there are, in, in one case, I think the singer had to sing it five times, and every <laughs> time it was exactly different. You know, and the audience just loved it. I think somebody mentioned that if that performance, since that performance could not be captured, that was it. You'd have to go home and you'd never hear it again. That's, that's right. And, of course, it made, it made live music very precious, you know, that you, you'd hear something that might never occur again. Uh, there was, for example, in Naples, a... Uh, an instrument salesman, uh, like a keyboard instrument salesman from uh, Austria who was visiting uh, Naples, and he was selling uh, an instrument that uh, was not a big success and, and, and didn't exist for very long, but it was called a vis-a-vis -vis piano or vis-a-vis -vis keyboard. Um, you know how a, a harpsichord or a grand piano has a somewhat triangular shape, right? Well, if you put two back to back, they sort of complete uh, <laughs> yes. a rectangle. Yes. Right. Well, this Austrian manufacturer merged a harpsichord and a forte piano in one box. So one player would sit at one end and the other player would sit at the other end and they would look at each other. Right. So um, this, this salesman, his name was Hadrava, I think, and uh, Paisiello, who went on to become uh, Napoleon's. Uh, head of music, <laughs> they were in the same place, and uh, the salesman was uh, giving a demo on this two-part instrument. So Paisiello sits down, and uh, Paisiello uh, starts a theme, and and the salesman picks up on it, and they start improvising, uh, the two of them together, uh, for about a half hour. And, you know, if you think about that today, you know, you could easily have two jazz musicians playing together. But for it to work, they would have to guess or agree on some chord progressions, you know, kind of agreement of where they're going to go. Well, in the 18th century, it wasn't so much chord progressions, but uh, what I call schemas. In other words, like, we're going to do one of those, and, oh, now we're going to do one of those. So, for example, let's say that Paisiello starts out by playing a pattern. The bass goes dum, boom, 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 boom. 
and it's just one, two, three, two, one, two, three. The other guy will pick up on that. He'll know what goes with it, what kind of counterpoints work, what kind of chords work. And they can sort of communicate with each other pattern by pattern and make their way through it. Uh, there's another case where Dietersdorf, a famous court musician in Vienna, he uh, he was with a harpsichordist, and uh, the emperor shows up and asks them to play uh, a sonata. He didn't have any music, so they just faked it. They, they <laughs> improvised the sonata, the two of them. But again, that only works if they both know the same repertory of, of licks, you might say. So you mentioned that they didn't really think about chords per se. So can we... So is it a mistake to apply Roman numeral analysis to this music? Are we missing anything here? Yes. Uh, uh, this, this is a, a, you know, I, I preach against Roman numerals, you might say. <laughs> uh, I think it's important. Uh, I'll, I'll just try and quickly outline where they came from, you know. Um, they came from music schools and music schools for amateurs. The um, the poor pro apprentices, you know, they were sometimes orphans, but apprentices, the, the kids who entered the Paris Conservatory or the Naples Conservatories, um, you know, they did this six days a week, dawn to dusk for about 10 years. They learned thousands of things, you know, during that time, and they became professionals. Now, if we change the equation... And we start thinking about upper and middle class people attending a college or a kind of private school, and they take a music class. Well, what can they really learn? They're not going to spend 10 years. They're not going to spend dawn to dusk, right? What they end up, instead of learning music, instead of learning harmony and counterpoint, what they learn are stories about counterpoint, stories about harmony. And one of these stories is Roman numerals. It's not that there's no, I mean, if, if you show me a C major chord, I will say it's a C major chord. And if the key is C major, I can put a one up below it. And I, I haven't done anything terrible. Okay. <laughs> right. But what will happen is if that's your approach to 18th century music, you'll miss a lot of the interesting stuff because they didn't think that way. That was not how they approached this music. You know, e even the word tonality is is foreign to the 18th century. It's, it's a 19th century term. Uh, they, they thought about this music as counterpoint. And so, you know, you, you wrote a bass and then the melody is a counterpoint to that. And if it's a good counterpoint, then, I mean, you, you're not going to throw dissonances in crazily. You know, they, they had a very clear sense of how dissonances should be resolved. And there was a kind of syntax or, or grammar of chords, a very simple one, but it's not how they composed. Let's expand on that. You mentioned that Gallant musicians have a different conception of keys and tonality. Does that relate to modes and does that relate to, or is that major and minor? How did they know when they had modulated to a different key? The Italians are probably the first to really uh, start talking about scale degrees. Uh, you know, they will say primo del tono, primo di tono, uh, secondo del tono. You have to pardon me that sometimes I slip into Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Italian. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, they they were one of the first, and you were expected to be very clear about which key you were leaving or, or entering. Um, but l let me give you an example. Um, th there's a professor at uh, Northwestern, uh, Vasily Biros, and... Uh, he, he devised a really interesting experiment. I mean, this wasn't a, uh, you know, carefully controlled psychological experiment, <laughs> but, it, but it made its point. Uh, there's a pattern that I call the printer riposte, and it's, it's the most common comeback to an opening gesture in 18th century music. So, for example, let's say that Mozart, well, he writes a C major uh, piano sonata, and I don't have absolute pitch, so somewhere near <laughs> the center of my vocal range, it would go tom pa tom pa da da dum. Okay, that's the opening gambit. That's that's kind of the first move in his in his sonata. What comes next is a printer post. 
in terms of scale degrees, it's six, five, two, five, four, three, dum, ba, dee, da, da, dum, right? That's one of the most common things in the 18th century. <laughs> uh, it's second only to cadences in terms of how, how common it is. Now, the, the way it would be sung in an 18th century solfeggio would probably be La so so fa mi la so fa mi. Okay, I think I modulated in between there, but I meant this for it to be. No, no, you're making the point. Before. Yes. Now, here's an option in the 18th century. He could have done this. He could have gone dum pa da di da da dum pum, and you know, raise the last note an octave, and then. You know, in the original notation, he would suddenly be in G major. So, you know, the the original notes go um, C, da, da, B, C, then A, G, F, E. But he could go E, D, C, B, right? In the solfege of the time, both of those patterns are la, sol, fa, mi. I mean, there's some other ways to solfege it, but that would be one way, la, sol, fa, mi. And it's the same solfege whether it's in G major or C major, okay, because it's the same interval pattern. Well, here's back to um, Professor Beerus' experiment. He played uh, that Mozart sonata for people, you know, so it was properly at the right pitch. And on a screen, like a PowerPoint screen, he flashed, I think it was the numbers of the beats, you know, like, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four like that. Uh, but, but they were counting from the beginning. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So people had a clear sense of the number of the beat. And yeah. so his, his question was, um, write down the number where you hear the modulation. In other words, write down the number of the beat where you hear the modulation. And then he, he asked people to kind of, in some way, encapsulate how familiar they were with early with 18th century music. You know, and some people, oh, okay, I play the Mozart sonata. Okay, that's a little bit. But somebody else, oh, I'm in an early music ensemble. I, I listen to 18th century music all day long. Well, it turned out that the more 18th century music you heard, the earlier you heard the modulation. So, for example, if you went, dum, pa, da, dum, da, da, dum, dum, pa, when you hear that note, somebody really familiar with 18th century music already feels that they're moving to, to the dominant key. But there's no overt sign of it. It begins with a C major chord, and it turns out in retrospect to be heard as kind of the subdominant of the dominant. But there's no overt clues at all. It's only your knowledge of the patterns that makes you think, ah, oh, okay, we're shifting. Because there are no um, changes to the key signature, I mean, because there's no that F right. sharp. There's no F sharp there. The F sharp doesn't come in until the uh, the third stage of that pattern. No. So who is right, Doctor Yardigan? Is the person who has heard a lot of 18th century music and hearing the modulation earlier? So is that the correct way to think about it? That that point is when you've actually changed key. Well, everybody's correct for themselves. Oh. Right? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> and uh, what we what we run into very quickly is. Uh, the same kind of disputes that arose in uh, performance. So you have historically informed performance, and you know that that's a that's a uh, a term that was developed. Uh, you might say to be a little bit uh, less um, <laughs> less holier than thou. You know they used to call it authentic performance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the tradition of romantic musicians performing 18th century music is longer than the 18th century. I mean, musicians have been putting a romantic spin on the 18th century for over two centuries. <laughs> so it's a 
a tradition of its own. You know, it's an authentic tradition on its own. What you've said, Dr. Yodi, is actually, it's kind of troubled me a little bit because now that I'm thinking about that piece, those first bars, I don't, I'm just thinking that we're in C because uh, from my training is Roman numeral analysis. I'm just thinking one and then five and then one and then four and then one and then five and then one and then four. But that's that's all not how they thought, right? But, 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 well, it, it's it's not completely simple. In other words, they were aware, you know, that there were relationships between different chords. Uh, in one of Mozart's uh, lessons with um, Thomas Atwood, he writes, uh, he shows an inversion of a chord and then shows the root position and says, well, these are similar, you know. So it's not that they didn't think that way, but for example, uh, CPE Bach, uh, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, the uh, maybe the most famous son in his lifetime of Bach, said that J.S. Bach did not really buy this inversion business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And if you think about it, uh, you know, the inversions of chords are not used the same way. Uh, in, a, in other words, if you're writing in the style of Bach, you can't throw in any inversion of a chord in a particular instance. It's usually a very particular version of the chord. So from Bach's point of view, those were different things because they were used differently. You know, the counterpoint is what was learned and they filled in chords. And let's say that you have a, a bass that makes a cadence and it goes, well, um, let's, let's take that printer repost that I'm talking about, you know, when the melody goes la so fa mi, the most common bass would be a tenth below each of those notes. So if the if the melody goes a g f e, the bass the most common bass will go f e d c or f e d g c like two five one at the end. Okay, so. As I was saying, this is one of the most common patterns in all of 18th century music. So now if we think about chords and we, we say, okay, what are the, what are the chords? <laughs> the conclusion would be that four goes to one six. Okay. But if you go to a harmony class, that's not what they say about four. They'll say four goes to five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, is the printer wrong? Well, no, of course not, because it's not that the chord has some kind of inner essence, you know, and wants to do something or has its own that life That is an style. interesting, okay, now you're really, you've really, I mean, you've already greatly troubled me with these important uh, thoughts. We've always been trained that the dominant chord, like a cadential chord, like five to one is, that's a, that's a move that's very powerful because five is unstable or something and it wants to go up to one strongly are you saying then it's uh it's different to think of chords differently then that we don't have these these inner uh, qualities that they all have these inner functions that they must fulfill yes in other words instead of thinking of chords as the thing um uh, the thing in the 18th century was contrapuntal contexts okay so for example um in that printer, when the F goes to E and the A goes to G in the melody, a third voice could hold a C, for example, and then you'd have a four going to one six. But the other voice could also have a D going to C, and then you'd have two six to one six. In terms of the 18th century pattern, it doesn't matter. And, you know, two six going to one six that doesn't sound at all like chord grammar. Yeah, that's right. Right. So what, what happened again, you know, the, the chord grammar was developed for middle and upper class dilettantes. Wow. Oh, that is mind blowing. Who, 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 who were taking college classes. Okay. They were in one and a higher social status than musicians. Musicians were artisans. You know, they worked with their hands. They went to trade school. And they work for the people who got to go to college. <laughs> so the, the artisans spent a lifetime learning all the details of this stuff. And in college, they just learned about it. 
You know, they would take a class. You could take a class on space travel. Well, you don't learn how to go to space. You just read about it, right? So in the same way, in a harmony class, you read about harmony. And the, the kind of sleight of hand that was developed in the 19th century was to imagine that actually it's, everything's a cadence. Whole pieces are cadences. Everything's a cadence. So you only have to learn... You only have to learn the grammar of cadence, and now you know harmony. Oh, I'm shook. I'm shaking. <laughs> let me ask you. Let me ask you something now. So Heinrich Schenker was sure. an extremely influential music theorist, and his ideas have definitely yeah. shaped music analysis. In light of your research, it would appear that uh, Schenkerian analysis—it's difficult to use that on 18th-century Gallant music. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think that's that's true. Um, it, it works better on some things than others. I mean, Schenker was, was a very sensitive musician. And um, he also hated Roman numeral. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was all for, he was all in on counterpoint. Mm. You know? He's and all so, in. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm with him. I'm, I'm with him on, on that. But, you know, he, he was, well, you might say, in the newspapers of, of the Vienna of his day, he was like a blogger, kind of like an independent voice. And in that world, you didn't get noticed by being modest or by uh, trying to present sort of both sides of a picture. You know, he, he went all in and uh, claimed that, he, you might say, there was one contrapuntal pattern to rule them all what he called the, Ur, the Urzats. I mean, there were different variations of it, but so he, he kind of, um, he took it a little bit too far. Uh, one of my own teachers was Leonard Meyer and Leonard Meyer and Grosvenor Cooper uh, wrote a book on rhythm in the 1960s. And they were talking about rhythm in terms of uh, uh, similar to poetic feet, you know, like da da or da da you know, strong, weak, weak, strong patterns like that. And uh, they went so far as to describe a sonata as like the, the exposition is kind of an upbeat to a, you know, the recapitulation is kind of a downbeat and I forget the details, but, you know, I, and I was talking to him, I said, you know, w w what's with that? You know, I said, that's, that's like, that's metaphysics, right? That's way beyond. <laughs> and I remember him saying, he, he's saying, well, you know, if you, if you, if you put some meat in a sausage grinder, you just can't, you just can't resist giving it one more turn. <laughs> 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 so, you know, just like, uh, just like Meyer with this, uh, rhythmic analysis where, you know, he just probably took it beyond what, what was reasonable. Uh, personally, you know, I think the chinker sometimes took things beyond what was reasonable. It's possible that he had absolute pitch. You know, for someone with absolute pitch, you can say, well, I'm waiting for this G from 10 minutes ago to do something, right. you know, <laughs> but, but my, my brain doesn't work that way. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a local key and I can be sensitive to where I are, uh, where it's going and, and, and modulations like that, but I don't. I don't hear relationships over great, great distances. You know? But Schenker, uh, to, to the extent that he was very sensitive about counterpoint, I think he's uh, he's worth reading, just just without the metaphysics. Right. <laughs> I mean, the last ten minutes, I want to talk about your book and your study tackles the 18th century. I think the ramifications of the book are wide-reaching because they could really really in light of what how these great masters thought i think they could, would you say there are applications in the modern sense with this information and how we approach composition and improvisation uh yes um yeah i'm i'm glad i'm glad you think that, that that's a possibility because i i certainly do I, i'm just finishing a, a second book kind of a music in the galant style too <laughs> that uh, it's it's about uh a lot of it is about the 19th century in the Paris Conservatory and how these things were developed into chromatic harmony, romantic uh, harmony. And uh, it, it was the same process. You know, you learned lots of patterns and you learned to apply them um, as, as a craft, you know, not as a, as an academic subject, really. 
is this idea of improvisation, this entire method, is it robust enough to take us, or at least to make us understand how to approach improvisation and composition all the way with the most radical harmonies and the most modern sense of rhythm and everything? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Claude Debussy, for example, um, won a prize at the Paris Conservatory for improvising on, on Partimenti, basically, you know, this keyboard harmony stuff. Um, I mean, Ravel, uh, who's, you know, an amazing harmony writer, uh, had, had this exact training. Uh, Olivier Messiaen had this kind of training. <laughs> okay. Uh, now it's not for everybody. And so I guess what I'm, what I envision is that people who want to learn classical music, I mean, who are really passionate about classical music, whether it's Bach or Beethoven or, or what, what have you, um, they really ought to learn it the classical way. <laughs> okay. You know, they shouldn't learn a fairy tale. Uh, I mean, there's an old saying that counterpoint or harmony is a fairy tale told about counterpoint. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And they shouldn't learn the fairy tale. They should learn the real thing. Um, you know, there are, there are a number okay, of teachers. Okay, that's great. Let's get, let's get into it. All right, so let's say, how would you, if they, somebody first came to the keyboard, what would you make them do? Ah, I used to teach a class like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a keyboard lab, and I taught a class, you know, technically, legally, it was on figured bass. But it was really on partimento playing. <laughs> and we tried, uh, somewhat like, uh, like a, an immersion foreign language class, we tried to hardly ever say anything. So I would play like a three-note pattern, and then I would give the students uh, a model response. So if I could go, do, re, mi, they could go, do, si, do, right? And then we would work on variations of that. We would develop a, a middle voice, and those people would play that and do some variations on it. We just slowly worked up a, a knowledge of, you might say, stimulus and response. You know, if you hear this pattern, do this. And it was amazing how fast we went. I mean, there was one pianist, he had very good chops as a pianist, but I remember he... Uh, after 10 weeks in this course, it was in quarters, uh, he went off to Amsterdam and, and enrolled in a high-level, um, <laughs> you know, uh, thorough basic accompanying uh, Basso Continuo class. Um, you know, if you don't talk about music, it's surprising how much you How can effective it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, counterpoint. Uh, is, there a, a, is there a right way to learn counterpoint and a wrong way to learn counterpoint? Yes, Uh this is this is very difficult uh, because um, the influence of, of Fuchs and and that uh, the species counterpoint approach. I don't mean that it's not valuable and it's not useful, but it's only the very first step. It, it, it's it's this is historically complicated. Um, they knew about this stuff somewhat in Italy because Italy invented this stuff, but the book of Fuchs and how he approached this is not really how the Italians were trained. And it's not really how a lot of practical musicians were trained. Uh, I mean, they, they would say nice things about Fuchs. Fuchs was the music director for the emperor of Austria. You know, that this, this was a very high position. So you, you didn't diss him. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, the original edition was gigantic volumes leather bound okay no no 10 year old musician could buy such a thing you know it it really was for show and um what counterpoint was a lot in italy was that you were you, you were given a partimento bass and then you wrote a melody over it and what distinguished their training was that you had to do that five or six times different every time over the same bass so, so it was like endless practice in variation on, on basic patterns. It's actually not unlike what some jazz musicians do <laughs> with, with pattern books, you know, where they'll, they'll, uh, they'll play a certain progression uh, a hundred different ways. Well, Dr. Yerdigan, people, people get afraid of that because they say, 
well, you know, I don't want to have a parallel fifth or a parallel eighth going on, so I'm kind of nervous. I want to be careful of every note I play. Well, this this was the advantage of doing partimento training before counterpoint training, because in 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 partimento training you learned, for example, to if you had the choice, you would always move the voices, you would always move your hands in opposite motion. They would both go out, or they'd both go in, or if they went in the same way, it would be by thirds or sixths. So you, you kind of physically learn to avoid the situations that would create parallel fifths or octaves. And also, you didn't actually sweat the inner voices too much. There could be parallel fifths or octaves in the inner voices, and it, it didn't actually matter too much in the keyboard playing. It was, you could call it a kind of orchestration, you know, it was just for more sonority. Anyway, the, the, the problem today uh, for a student is that uh, good counterpoint teachers are hard to come by. Okay, so where can somebody go? Definitely buy, I would highly recommend everybody buy Dr. Yerdigan's book, uh, Music of the Gallant Style, and your follow-up book. When is that going to be released, Dr. Yerdigan? Probably in uh, in November. Wonderful. Get those two books. And do you have a, a title for it? Uh, we're working on that right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> and are there any uh, recommendations that you would give, resources, links, that you could give to somebody who is who is um, interested in developing Partimento? Yeah. In the back of the book, there's a, a, a an appendix on for further study. Uh, you could also go to, um, if you... If you can figure out how to spell my name or just Partimento, uh, there's a big website called Monuments of Partimenti where there's a lot of information. There's also a Google site. If you do, uh, if you search Google says Partimento, um, there's a site that has some lessons in it for beginners and some some guidelines. Uh, there's a book by Giorgio Sanguinetti called The Art of Partimenti. It's uh, scholarly, but it, it's also very useful. And, well, there are 100 YouTube videos that you can watch, <laughs> okay? They're under an old title of the new book, so it, it, it will eventually change, but currently it's called The Orphans in the Jungle. It was like, uh, you know, related to Mozart in the Jungle. But anyway, those, those videos will be around uh, probably under a different title, but there'll be a link. But anyway, um, I think, uh, especially if someone is just beginning, uh, they might uh, benefit from seeing and hearing, you know, instead of just reading about something like this. Uh, Parlamento is all about doing. And so um, those videos might be helpful. All right. Well, the great Dr. Yerdigan, Robert Yerdigan, author of Music of the Gallant Style with Oxford University Press. We're so excited for your book. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to explain these really revolutionary ideas that are coming back into vogue. I do believe that the culture around classical music is changing and will be adopting those ideas. And if the culture does change, it has a lot to do with the trailblazing work you've done and the scholarly research. We owe you a tremendous debt. Uh, Dr. Yerdigan, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.